Aloha everyone and welcome back to Nutrition here at Chaminade University. Today we are going to be discussing digestion, absorption, and transport. So we'll be talking all about the digestive system. We'll be talking about the process of digestion and all of the organs that are involved in digestion as well as the, as the accessory organs that produce biomolecules that are needed for digestion but don't actually come in contact with the food products themselves. We'll talk about how food is propelled through the gastrointestinal tract and what we call it at each stage of digestion. We'll talk about different enzymes and their role in chemical digestion, and we'll talk about how nutrients that are digested get absorbed across the intestinal lining, we'll talk about hormones that are involved in regulation, and also how the nervous system is involved in, in regulating digestion. Additionally, we'll talk about how the nutrients that are absorbed are transported throughout the body and their roles in their cells, as well as several of the most common digestive disorders. So what is digestion? Digestion is the process of taking large food molecules and breaking it down into smaller individual molecules, so small that they're able to be absorbed through the intestinal wall and picked up either by the capillary bed or by the lymphatic system in the case of fats. We'll talk about absorption, which is how the nutrients are actually moved from the gastrointestinal tract into the circulatory system, how they're transported throughout the circulatory and the limb system, and finally, how they are eliminated from the body, which is the process of excretion. On the left, we have all of the organs that are organs of the GI tract. On the right, we have accessory organs, i.e. organs that are involved in digestion but don't actually come in contact with the food or food products. Here in the mouth is where the process of digestion begins. And we have two different types of digestive processes. One is a chemical process and one is a physical process or a mechanical process. So mechanical digestion starts with a process of what's called mastication or chewing. And that's how we can tear, shred, and mix our food up. We're going to be adding saliva to this as well. And saliva is going to have amylase and lipases. So it's going to have um, different enzymes that are involved in breaking down carbohydrates and lipids. Um, and at this point, the food is going to be called a bolus. So the bolus of food is going to get swallowed and head down, head down the pharynx and through the esophagus through the process of propulsion. Now propulsion or swallowing is actually um, a series of concentric muscular contractions, meaning that you could actually swallow even if you were, for example, hanging upside down. Once you get into the stomach, you have, again, both mechanical and chemical digestion. So you have mechanical digestion in that it's churning. Um, and we're going to be mixing in enzymes and gastric fluid. At this point, this bolus of food is now called chyme. Um, and all those enzymes are going to be involved in the process of chemical digestion. So we're going to specifically have a protein called, or an enzyme called pepsin, which breaks down proteins. Um, and we're also going to begin the process of absorption, or the transfer of biomolecules across the membrane into the bloodstream. After food leaves the stomach, it's going to enter into the small intestines, where again, we're going to have mechanical and chemical digestion. Uh, mechanical digestion is going to also include propulsion at this point, which allows the movement of food in small little motions forward throughout the intestines. Um, as we enter from the small intestines into the large intestines, we're going to um, enter into a little bit more chemical digestion, but mainly the absorption of water and salts, etc. And we're going to continue with the process of propulsion until we eventually are going to enter into the um, colon and rectum, where we're going to eliminate fecal matter. Um, on the right, we have accessory organs. The accessory organs, again, are going to provide some sort of enzymes generally, um, so some sort of fluid, but they're not going to actually come in contact with the food itself. That's that's going to include the salivary glands, which again produces amylase, um, mucus, other chemicals. Also, it's going to include a lipase, which breaks down lipids. Um, in the liver, the liver is going to start producing bio. That's how we're going to be digesting fats. And that bio is going to get stored in the gallbladder, and it's going to get released into the small intestines as needed, basically from signals from the small intestines that says that food has entered. We also have the pancreas. The pancreas is going to produce more digestive enzymes and also bicarbonate ions. Bicarbonate ions are going to help buffer the situation, help us bring us back up to a normal level of pH. Remember, the stomach is going to have a really low pH and the intestines is going to have a normal pH of about 7. So the pancreas is going to secrete bicarbonate ions that's going to help bring that pH in the intestines back up again. All right, so the entire process of digestion involves what's known as the gastrointestinal tract, and that's a 23-foot-long muscular tube that starts with the mouth and ends with the rectum. Five major organs are going to make up the GI tract, including the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestines, and large intestines, and food's going to pass from one organ to the next through sphincters, or little muscular, um, well, doorways, basically, that are going to allow food to pass from one area to the next. 
And then we also have accessory organs that include the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder that are going to secrete digestive enzymes. These are going to be outside of the digestive tract but are going to aid in digestion without actually coming in contact with the food. Two different types of digestion, as I've mentioned, mechanical and chemical. Mechanical is going to be anything that's going to be um, chewing, grinding, squeezing, anything that's going to move food but is not going to, it's going to allow it to mix, for example, with the enzymes, but it's not going to involve enzymatic reactions themselves. That would fall under the category of chemical digestion. And both of these are going to start in the mouth. So saliva is going to contain two enzymes, amylase and lipase. Um, amylase is going to break down carbohydrates, lipids. Lipase is going to break down lipids. So saliva is going to start dissolving the small food particles. Um, and then we're going, to, um, we're going to then swallow that bolus of food, which is then going to enter into the pharynx and into the esophagus. The esophagus is going to take that bolus of food down into the stomach, and it's going to enter into the stomach through a sphincter. It's also going to leave the stomach through the sphincter. So um, getting into the esophagus is going to have another sphincter as well. So to get in this esophagus, you have to go through the upper esophageal sphincter. That's going to allow the bolus of food to enter into the esophagus, that first act of swallowing. And at the bottom, we have the lower esophageal sphincter, which is going to allow the bolus of food to leave the esophagus and enter into the stomach. So that's going to be at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. Now it's kind of like this. Here's a bolus of food traveling down the esophagus, reaching into, here's the stomach. When the lower esophageal sphincter is relaxed, that food is able to enter into the stomach. And as soon as it has entered, the lower esophageal sphincter contracts. And this is important because remember, this has a lot of acidic juices, right? Hydrochloric acid is going to be secreted by those gastric pits. And we don't really want that to end up inside the esophagus or we can end up with heartburn or uh, GER, gastroesophageal reflex. Um, once this food is entered into the stomach, again, we have that contraction, and you can see here that the liquid that was a bolus has now um, started to dissolve in the fluid that was already in the stomach. Okay, so let's talk about the epiglottis. The epiglottis is the tiny little piece of your upper pharynx that is responsible for sending food down the esophagus, and when it's open, it allows air to go down the trachea. So here's the esophagus up. So when the trachea is open, this is normal breathing conditions. As we're entering into swallowing, we're going to take that bolus of food, put it to the back of the mouth, lift it up with the tongue. And as we actually swallow, this epiglottis is going to slide down like this, allowing the food to slip past it and down the esophagus as opposed to entering into the trachea, which would cause choking. All right, so once the food enters into the stomach, the food, the food is going to interact with gastric juices, which are involved in chemical digestion. So we have both mechanical digestion, when we have churning and mixing and pushing all the enzymes and the gastric juices inside of the food itself. Um, but we also have chemical digestion, which is going to occur by the enzymes and how they are going to be breaking down the food in the stomach. Um, the stomach holds about one cup empty, but can expand to hold up to one gallon. So it's a pretty amazing difference in space and how much space it can actually take up in your belly area, in your abdomen. Um, and once we have taken that food, put it in the stomach, and had let it interact with all of those stomach juices, now it's going to be called chyme. Um, so this is going to be a semi-liquid, partially digested food mass. It's going to leave the stomach and enter into the small intestines. And it's going to do this in the small little bits. So while we may have eaten that entire meal in one sitting, right, that entire gallon has come in in about 10 minutes or so, um, only one teaspoon is going to leave the stomach every 30 seconds or so. So we're going to dose it out in the small intestines in small amounts. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. But the primary reason is that we have just taken it and lowered the pH very, very far. So it's a very acidic solution that's coming into the small intestines, and we have to restore that to normal pH for any of the enzymes in the small intestines to work. And the best way to do that is to have just a little bit at a time leak out that then we can attack with, well, we can mix with the bicarbonate ions that are going to be coming from the pancreas to help bring that pH back up. Now, the sphincter between the stomach and the small intestines is called the pyloric sphincter, and that's going to be the gateway for chyme to enter into the small intestines from the stomach. This diagram depicts the anatomy of the stomach. The lower esophageal sphincter is going to be the connection between the esophagus and the stomach, and then here we have the pyloric sphincter, which is going to allow it to enter into the small intestines. The stomach is going to have three layers of muscle. Most of the rest of the GI tract is only going to have two, but there's an additional one here in the stomach called diagonal muscles. So we have longitudinal and circular muscles, which we will see many times as we enter through the rest of the digestive tract. But here we also have these diagonal muscles 
And those are depicted here in a cross section that they're all actually running different directions. And that allows for the churning of the stomach to help mix all of the food together. If we take a look at a cross section of the stomach walls, we see that we have these specialty goblet cells that are responsible for secreting um, mucus as well as um, G, uh, sorry, as well as hydrochloric acid from these gastric pits, right? Um, and this is the opening of the gastric pits where we're going to be releasing the mucus and the it's very low pH fluid. Um, we also have chief cells down in here. We have parietal cells that are right at the very tip. And then underneath that, we have the submucosal layer. And you're going to see this over and over and over as we travel through the um, through the digestive tract. We have a layer of submucosal. It's going to have a ton of capillaries. These capillaries also, mind you, so you're seeing the capillaries in blue and red, but we also are seeing here are what are called lacteals, and these are shown in green. That's part of the lymphatic system, and that's going to help us carry things that are fat-soluble across the intestinal wall to be able to figure out how to get them back into the bloodstream. Remember, they're not going to be able to go into the bloodstream directly because only water-soluble things are going to be able to be carried directly through the bloodstream. All right, so I digress. So after we pass through the stomach, we're going to enter into the small intestines. It has three major sections, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. And again, we have both mechanical and chemical digestion, where the mechanical digestion is going to have these muscular contractions that are moving the time forward. And we also have digestive secretions that are coming through, so that's chemical digestion, to help break down the nutrients. Additionally, we've maximized our surface area. So the small intestines is lined with what are called villi, and at the tip of them we have microvilli. And these are going to maximize our surface area, which then helps maximize absorption. And most of the time that food travels through the intestinal tract, it's in contact with the small intestines between 3 to 10 hours. So these are some of the structures of the small intestinal wall. So first we have circular folds. That's going to allow for food to kind of move and be propelled. Um, and if you take a cross section here, we have villi. So villi are going to have what's called a lacteal in the center, and a lacteal is going to be lymphatic fluid. That's going to be where we're picking up our fats. We also have um, capillaries. What we're showing here, in if you enlarge it a little bit, those are goblet cells. We're going to be secreting more digestive enzymes through those. And if we look at the tip of the microvilli, right, if we take a cross section, I'm sorry, look at the tip of the villi, right, a cross section there, we're going to see microvilli, which are going to have these little brush border enzymes on the tip, which are going to, going to be allowing for the maximization of absorption. Okay, so chyme's going to enter the large intestines through the ileocecal valve. That means it's coming from the small intestines to the large in intestines. Um, and you'll see in a second why that makes sense. It's named after the features of the small and the large intestines. Now, the large intestines is about five feet long. It's about two and a half inches in diameter, so it is definitely wider. And it has three segments, the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. So see cecal being the first part of the intestines and ileum being the end of the small intestines. So that would be the ileocecal valve. Um, and the main role of the large intestines is water, sodium, potassium, and chloride absorption. So it's going to be resorbing a lot of the water and a lot of the different minerals or um, ions that we have basically been dumping into the digestive tract that now we're going to be re re zooming them or resorbing them before we can um, allow the, the rest of the waste to pass through. We also have bacteria in our small intestines that are responsible for producing um, many things, including vitamin K, riboflavin, biotin, um, but the only ones that are absorbed out of that are biotin and vitamin K. So these are, um, these are things that we are not able to create ourselves, but we rely on the bacteria to produce for us under normal digestive conditions. Um, bacteria play other roles too. The, one of the major roles is fermentation. So they ferment the undigested and unabsorbed carbohydrates, so the unabsorbed absorb sugars into smaller compounds, which releases things like methane gas and carbon dioxide and hydrogen, which is why we off-gas um, during the process of digestion. Additionally, when fiber ferments, it produces short-chain fatty acids. Now, in the large intestines, we are approximately going to have one liter of fluid material coming in and reducing it to about 200 grams of solidified brown fecal material. And generally, the intestinal matter is going to take about 12 to 70 hours to pass through the large intestines, depending on the health, age, diet, and fiber intake of the individual that we are talking about. This here describes the anatomy of the large intestines. So here we have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the sigmoid colon, and here's the rectum. And this little dangly thing here is the appendix. 
It's going to be found right at the connection between the ilium and the cecum just after the ileocecal canal. And it's presumed that in the past it was used to remove things like stones and other biomaterial that we didn't want to necessarily have pass through the intestines and then they would just kind of sit there forever. Um, now we don't actually believe that it would function in that fashion, but it's vestigial, which means that it's from an era when we did have it and it hasn't been selected against. One of the major run-ins that we have with the appendix, of course, is appendicitis, where this can be um, astronomically inflamed and requires surgery to have it removed. There's really no downside to having it removed. Um, it's just one of those things that we have because we used to have, not because we actually need to use anymore. Um, I also want to point out these little yellow pieces here, actual connective tissue that are going to be connecting the large intestine to the inside or the omentum or the inside of the belly. So these are going to be kind of held in place and tacked down. So although they can move a little bit, they're not going to have great range of motion. They're not going to be sliding all over each other. All right, so large intestines, obviously, his objective is to absorb as much water and whatever leftover nutrients as possible. Um, and so it's going to be propelled with what is now called stool, right? It's going to be propelled through the intestines until it reaches the rectum. And that's that last eight inch portion of the large intestines. And while we are unable to control the motion into the, um, the rectum from the large intestines, the very final stage of defecation is under voluntary control. So we are able to say, oh, now it's time and have the amount of time that we need to get to a bathroom. Um, this voluntary control can be influenced by multiple things, including age, right? To very young and very elderly might have a little bit more difficulty. Uh, your diet, if it's just too liquidy, there's only so much you can do. Prescription medications, health and abdominal muscle tone. Obviously, you need to have good muscle tone to be able to hold something while you maneuver to the bathroom. All right, so let's move on to the accessory organs. The accessory organs, as I mentioned previously, are going to include the salivary glands, the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. These are all going to be responsible for creating and secreting digestive juices. The salivary glands are going to secre uh, secrete saliva, which again has a couple of enzymes in there. Um, the liver is going to create bile, which is then going to get stored in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is going to store that bile and concentrate that bile until we need to dump it into the small intestine. So basically the small intestines will signal, hey, there's food coming in, and then that bile will be emptied in there. Additionally, we have the pancreas here, which is going to secrete, excuse me, um, it's going to secrete pancreatic enzymes. So the salivary glands are going to create saliva, which is going to help us dissolve small food particles. That makes it the easier for us to swallow food. Try swallowing a cracker without any saliva, right? Um, saliva is going to contain water, mucus, a couple of enzymes, and electrolytes. And we make about one quart of saliva every day. The liver is the largest organ in the body. It's about three pounds, and its major role is in absorption, digestion, transportation of nutrients. But it also is going to help um, degrade toxins and excessive hormones. Um, it also manufactures bile salts and makes proteins. So it's vital in a lot of different roles in the body, including carbohydrate metabolism. So the liver plays a lot of roles. The gallbladder is going to receive bile from the liver. So the role of the liver that we're going to talk about here is the creation of bile, which is then going to get secreted to the gallbladder. The gallbladder is going to concentrate that bile and release the bile into the small intestines. It does that via a duct called the common bile duct. Now the pancreas has both endocrine and exocrine function. Now in terms of the endocrine system, it's responsible for releasing hormones. This helps us maintain blood glucose levels. Um, too high, we get one set of hormones. Too low, we get another set. Um, and we also have exocrine function of the pancreas. And the, that's going to help us secrete digestive enzymes into the small intestines to allow us to aid in digestion. It's also going to secrete bicarbonate ions again, to help us restore that pH so that digestion can occur in the small intestines. Now, as food moves through the GI tract, it's going to be propelled by very strong muscular contractions, including peristalsis and segmentation. Um, peristalsis is going to be the sequential squeezing of food forward through the gastrointestinal tract um, under the process of, again, mechanical digestion. And segmentation is when food is, instead of being propelled forward, it's going to be propelled back and forth and back and forth. This is going to allow maximum contact with the surface area of the small and the large intestines, including the villi and the microvilli, and that's going to increase absorption of nutrients um, across the intestinal lining. Now, peristalsis, as I mentioned, is the propulsion of food in one direction, whereas segmentation is the propulsion of food back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, 
Here is showing you the stomach. Again, we have three sets of muscles in this one, longitudinal, circular, and diagonal. You'll note in the small intestines, while we do still have some muscles, we have two longitudinal and circular. We will not see that diagonal, diagonal muscle layer again that's specific to the stomach. Um, however, both of these are going to allow constriction to make wave-like motions that are going to propel food either forward or backward and forward. And we're going to be using both of the muscles for that. So the longitudinal and the circular muscles are going to be responsible for squeezing back and forth, whereas in the muscle, in the stomach, we're using longitudinal, circular, and diagonal muscles, which we are lacking in the small intestines. Now, chemical digestion occurs by digestive enzymes. And as you may know from any basic bio 101, enzymes are very specific for the reaction that they mediate. So we have a lot of different enzymes, one enzyme per each reaction. And the regulation of the concentration of all of these different enzymes is regulated by hormones. And almost all of the chemical digestion that occurs, occurs in the small intestines. And it's generally completed by the time the food reaches the large intestines. From this point forward, we're really only going to be focusing on the resorption of water and other nutrients. Now, again, enzymes, enzymes fall into the category of proteins in terms of biomolecules. Enzymes are proteins that are going to speed up the process of digestion because they're going to speed up or catalyze particular reactions. Some of them are going to catalyze the reaction of hydrolysis. Now, hydrolysis is basically when we're taking a water molecule and we're splitting it in half to make a hydroxyl group, an OH, and a hydrogen ion, right? And what happens there is that we're able to, when we break that water in half, we can take one OH group and one H group and cap off each of these newly split substances so that they no longer have the sticky ends that they had before that held them together. So how does that work? Here we have a substrate. This is a dimer, right? It has two of the train cars, if we're going to go back to that analogy. So the dimer is going to get bound by the enzyme. The enzyme is going to have a conformational change, so a little bit of a shape change. At the same time, water gets brought in and broken such that this bond can be broken because one end is capped with OH, the other is capped with H. And now these two molecules are both happy. I do want to point out here that the enzyme remains unchanged throughout the reaction. So while some enzymes will change shape here, by the time the, the reaction is over, the enzyme will appear as it did at the beginning because it is ready to run this reaction over and over and over again. And that's the beauty of enzymes is that they're able to mediate the same reaction thousands of times in a row very, very quickly. Now, in order for enzymes to work, they have parameters, just like any biomolecule. So we have to have enough of the enzyme and enough of the nutrient present to be able to have interaction between enzyme and nutrient. As I mentioned, enzymes are kind of like a lock and key. They're only compatible with a specific compound or nutrient. And oftentimes, enzyme pairs with whatever their um, molecule or substrate that they act upon are going to be ACE versus if it's a sugar, OSE. Anytime you see ACE, it's going to be an enzyme. So an example of that would be sucrase hydrolyzes sucrose. Another one we saw was amylase right, salivary amylase, which hydrolyzes amylose, right, another sugar. We also need to have the pH correct, so too high or too low, and we can kill off enzyme activity. Enzymes are most active within a certain range of both acidity and alkalinity. Outside that range, enzyme activity can be de decreased or halted altogether. And the same thing with temperature. Outside of the optimal temperature, Enzyme activity can be slowed if you bring it down too far, and you can restore that kind of um, loss. So if you were to heat it back up, some of it will be restored. But if the temperature is too high, you can denature it altogether, which can completely eliminate enzyme function. So again, we need to have appropriate concentrations of both the enzyme um, and the substrate. We need to have appropriate pH, and we need to have appropriate temperature. This here is a description of the different locations of enzymes and their actions. Um, and then so this is going to talk about the nutrient that they act upon. So salivary glands, for example, secrete salivary amylase, which starts the digestion of starches in the mouth. Um, and that's going to break down, again, starches, so carbohydrates. Stomach, we have pepsinogen, which gets converted into pepsin. We also have gastric lipase, so we're going to begin the digestion of polypeptides and lipids. That's, again, going to act on proteins and lipids. We also, in the pancreas, have pancreatic amylase, which breaks down starches. Again, that works on carbohydrates, similar to the salivary amylase. And then trypsinogen, anytime you see inogen, it's going to get broken down into. So pepsinogen gets broken down into pepsin, trypsinogen broken down into trypsin, chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin, etc.
Um, you can also see pro in front of that. So pro-carboxypeptidase is going to get broken down into carboxypepsidase. So if you see inogen or pro in front of that, then you know that it's probably going to be a precursor molecule to something that is going to be used later. So something that needs to be cleaved or whatnot. Um, again, trypsinogen is going to get cleaved into trypsin. Trypsin is going to be responsible for protein um, digestion. Similar to what we saw with pepsin in the stomach, however, pepsin is going to work at a very low pH, and when it enters into the small intestines, it's no longer going to function, and that's when trypsin is going to take over, and trypsin is going to work at the, I want to say normal pH, but a pH of approximately 7, so in the small intestines. Same thing with chymotrypsin. It's going to work on protein as well, um, and then carboxypeptidase is going to work on proteins as well by hydrolyzing the carboxyl onto the peptide, and that's going to release one amino acid at a time off of the peptide chain. You also have pancreatic lipase. You see lipase, you think immediately lipids, right? So it's going to break down lipids, so it's digesting triglycerides. And in the small intestines, we have a ton of different sugar digestions and lipid digestions. But the, so sucrase digests sucrose, maltase, maltose, lactase, lactose, yada, yada. Those are all examples of carbohydrates that are going to get absorbed and digested in the small intestines. Also dipeptidase and tripeptidase. It's going to work on proteins and lipase, which works on lipids. All right, so where do these things get secreted and what are the secretions? So in the salivary glands, we're secreting saliva. Again, has the enzyme salivary amylase, helps with swallowing. In the stomach, we have parietal cells. These are going to secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. The stomach also, by the gastric glands, secretes mucus. Now, hydrochloric acid is going to decrease our pH. It's going to activate pepsinogen into pepsin and denature proteins. Intrinsic factors are involved in vitamin B12 and other vitamin absorptions. Mucus is going to be secreted by gastric glands into the stomach, and the point of that is basically so that the stomach doesn't start digesting its own tissue, so it's going to coat the internal mucosa to protect it from chemical damage. Um, we also have intestinal juices. These are secreted in the intestines, so all of these are going to be working at the low pHs, right, caused by hydrochloric acid. Intestinal juice is going to be at a pH, a normal pH of about 7. It's going to have enzymes that digest carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. And it's not just intestinal juice. Intestines also secrete mucus to help protect the intestinal cells, just like we saw in the stomach. So the liver secretes bile that gets stored by the um, gallbladder and released by the gallbladder via what's called the common bile duct into the small intestines, and that happens when the small intestine signals that it has food present, particularly when it has lipids present. So bile is going to be responsible for breaking down large globules of lipid into smaller droplets of lipids, which are going to be able to get absorbed through the small intestines. And additionally, the pancreas is going to secrete bicarbonate ions, which are responsible for raising that pH back up to a normal pH in the small intestines to help neutralize that stomach acid so that all of a sudden the intestinal enzymes are going to be able to work again. All right, so the majority of absorption takes place in the small intestine. So it is started in the mouth, and then it is continued a little bit in the stomach, but the main bulk of absorption is going to take place in the intestines. And we can do that by a couple of ways, by passive diffusion, by facilitated diffusion, by active transport, or by endocytosis. Now, passive diffusion and facilitated diffusion are both going to be moving from a high concentration to a low concentration, and that means that no energy is required. However, facilitated diffusion means that we are going to need a carrier protein, probably the protein or whatever it is that we're moving in is too large, and it's going to need assistance from another carrier molecule. Again, no energy is required here, but we are going to need some sort of channel or something like that. Active transport is going to happen when we're going from low concentration to high concentration, and any time that we are going against a concentration gradient, we're going to require an input of energy. So that means that not only are we going to need to carry your protein, but we're going to need to break down ATP or some other energy currency molecule. And last but not least, we have endocytosis, which is when a vesicle is going to reach out, so the cell is going to form a vesicle around a nutrient and then engulf it and then pull it inside the cell. So these are the four methods of nutrient absorption in the small intestines. Here's passive diffusion, whereby the nutrients are going to pass right through the cell membrane. Again, that's going to go from high to low concentration. Anytime you're going with the concentration gradient from high to low, it doesn't require any energy. Anytime you're going against the gradient, 
like active transport, we already have high and we're bringing it in, that's going to require not only the carrier protein, but also an ATP molecule. So passive and facilitated diffusion are both going from high to low. The only difference being that this one is able to pass right through the membrane and this one needs a carrier protein, a channel of some sort. Um, and then the active transport is going to also need a carrier protein, but we're in also going to need to exchange ATP for ADP so that we can release energy and use that energy to drive the transport of the nutrient across the membrane against a concentration barrier. In D here we're showing endocytosis whereby the entire nutrient molecules are going to get engulfed by the cell membrane forming a me cell, pulling it into the cell and then engulfing it. So those are the four methods of nutrient absorption. Now as we're moving on to the large intestines, let's make it very clear here that there's very little left nutrition wise most of the nutrients have been absorbed before the chyme enters into the small intestine. So basically we're taking chyme now and we're turning it into stool and we're doing that by absorbing a ton of water and a ton of salt. Now we're going to be using the same mechanisms that we just talked about, namely passive diffusion and active transport for water and salts. So how do we coordinate all of this? We coordinate it with the endocrine system and the nervous system who are going to work in concert to coordinate digestion, absorption, and excretion of these waste products. And it's going to run most smoothly when we have very strong communication between the endocrine systems and the nervous systems, which are both going to have communication with the GI tract. Now remember, digestion is controlled by the enteric nervous system. And as we go all the way through the digestive system, you'll see there's a, a layer of nerve fibers that innervate the GI tract. They also innervate the pancreas and the gallbladder. And that's called the enteric nervous system. And the enteric nervous system serves to monitor a lot of different things in the digestive tract, including stomach contractions after eating and the amount of secretions of the cells in various regions of the GI tract. We also know that the GI tract is under hormonal regulation. And the hormones that are involved in regulating digestion do so by controlling several things, including enzyme activity, peristalsis, and the release of different secretions from the gastric pit, so gastric release secretions and pancreatic secretions. We have specialty biomolecules called enterogastrons that are produced by the cells that line the stomach and the small intestines and they play several roles including influencing the motility of the GI tract, the rate of stomach emptying, the contraction of the gallbladder, remember the gallbladder only wants to contract when the small intestines has food, the intestinal absorption rate, and the feeling of hunger versus satiety. And the release of these hormones is stimulated by the food passing through the digestive tract. So we have multiple different types of hormones that are involved in digestion, in regulation of digestion. And that's going to include secretin, which stimulates the pancreas to release that bicarbonate that we just talked about to increase the pH in the small intestines. Um, in the stomach, we have gastrin. Gastrin is going to stimulate the production of hydrochloric acid and also the release of different gastric enzymes. We also have CCK or cytokinin, which is going to stimulate the release of lipase from the pancreas and the release of bile from the gallbladder. Both of these are going to help with digestion. Obviously, they're going to be releasing digestive enzymes and juices. And additionally, it's going to CCK is going to slow down gastric motility to allow the chyme to sit. I'm sorry, to allow the, the yeah the chyme to sit for a little bit longer um, inside the stomach. Gastric inhibitory peptide or GIP inhibits gastric mobility as well, um, at motility as well, and also the secretions of the stomach. Again, there's no reason for us to be making the stomach churn around or secrete anything unless we actually have food there. So the presence or absence of food are going to be triggers for many of these pathways. Here are some other hormones, including ghrelin. Ghrelin is going to be stimulated by an empty stomach and it makes you feel hungry. It makes your stomach rumble when your stomach starts moving around. Um, that's going to stimulate the feeling of hunger. Gastrin is going to be stimulated by food in the stomach and that's going to secrete HCL or cause the secretion of HCL by the parietal cells. Small intestines are going to secrete the hormone secretin. When acidic chyme enters into the duodenum, so then duodenum is going to secrete the secretin, which stimulates the release of bicarbonate ions from the pancreas, which is important because that's going to take this acidic chyme and neutralize it so that then we can add the digestive enzymes in the small intestines. Um, CCK is going to be stimulated by fats and proteins in the duodenum. 
Again, it's secreted by the duodenum, and it's going to stimulate the secretion of bile from the gallbladder and bicarbonate ions and enzymes from the, um, from the pancreas. Um, GIP is going to be stimulated, secreted from the duodenum, stimulated by nutrients in the small intestines, and that's going to increase the secretions of the intestines and the pancreas, inhibit motility in the stomach. And last but not least, we have peptide YY, which is going to be stimulated when nutrients enter into the small intestines. It's going to be secreted from the ileum and also slow stomach motility. All right, so while we just talked about all these hormones and how the hormones regulate, we also have a nervous system regulation, which is going to allow us to communicate when we feel like eating, when we feel like drinking, and when to stop. So we have extrinsic and intrinsic nerves. Now, extrinsic nerves are going to communicate changes in the GI tract and stimulate motility. These are going to originate in the brain or spinal cord. And we also have intrinsic nerves, which are going to take the message from those extrinsic nerves and respond. Generally, they're going to do this by releasing digestive juices. And this entire intrinsic nerve layer is interwoven into the linings of multiple parts of the GI tract, including the esophagus, stomach, and both the small and large intestines. Now again, the hormones are going to be talking to your brain, giving you the feelings of being hungry or saying I'm full. That's going to include ghrelin and PYY. Ghrelin is going to increase hunger. Gastrin is also going to increase the secretions of the stomach and stomach motility. Um, and then also secretin is going to increase bicarbonate ions, etc. CCK increases enzymes from the pancreas. Um, but the feelings of hunger are going to be led by ghrelin increasing hunger with increasing levels. Peptide YY is going to feel like I'm full and it's going to decrease your hunger. Um, GIP is going to decrease the stomach motility, um, but it's not going to be involved in the feeling of feeling satiated. So the hormones that are involved in talking to the brain to say I'm hungry or I'm, I'm satiated are going to be ghrelin for hunger and PYY for the feeling of being full. Okay, so I talked to you a little bit about how fats weren't going to be able to be picked up by the same mechanisms as water-soluble nutrients. So fat-soluble nutrients here are transported through the lymphatic system, um, and they're actually going to get dropped into the blood through the left subclavian vein. But before they do that, they're going to actually end up going through the liver, through the hepatic portal vein, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But my point is that they can't just go directly into the blood supply. So how do they get picked up? So this is one villus. Inside the villus, we have our capillaries, and inside the capillaries, we have what's called a lacteal. Now, this is kind of like a dead-end street, if you can picture this as a through fare, but it's going to start here, and it's going to pick up any of the fat-soluble nutrients, and it's going to feed it into the lymphatic system. Now, the lymphatic system is going to send all the way up until here, um, where it's going to end up dumping into the thoracic duct into the blood. Okay, so water-soluble nutrients are going to be absorbed differently. They get absorbed through the hepatic portal vein to the liver. I apologize. Just a second ago, I told you that the fat-soluble ones went through the liver, and I apologize. It's a totally different mechanism. You can see they bypass the liver. They go through the lymph, then they go up, and then they get dropped into the thoracic ducts through the left subclavian vein, right? So I misspoke here about the liver. The liver is for water-soluble nutrients. So water-soluble nutrients are going to come in through the GI tract capillaries and then get filtered out through the hepatic portal vein and then head into the liver. So that's going to be here, the water-soluble ones. Fat-soluble nutrients are going to be absorbed through the lymphatic system. That's going to include fat-soluble vitamins like long-chain fatty acids and proteins. Anything that's going to be too large to be transported via capillaries is going to get picked up by those lymph capillaries get sent through the lymphatic vessels, and then get dropped in through the thoracic duct. Now, any waste products that are going to remain after nutrient absorption are going to be removed by the excretory systems. That's going to include the kidneys, which are responsible for filtering the blood and allowing waste products to be concentrated so they take the waste out of the blood. They concentrate it in the urine for excretion. Here's some common digestive disorders. It's going to include heartburn, this is what happens, um, G-E-R, so when you basically, it's a gastroesophageal reflux, basically what happens is you have some hydrochloric acid from your stomach that's able to make it out of that pyloric sphincter. I'm sorry, out of the upper esophageal sphincter, that's the one at the top, pyloric's at the bottom, through the upper 
lower esophageal sphincter into the esophagus, and so you're going to get burning of the esophagus. Um, esophageal cancer is also a very serious digestive disorder, which is going to make it that oftentimes you have difficulty eating, so you might have to have a tube put in. Um, belching and flatulence are flip sides of similar coins, right? Too much gas coming in or being created during the process of digestion. Um, gastroenteritis is going to be enteritis infl inflammation. Ulcers are when we are going to have little pockets, typically caused by Helicobacter pylori, which are going to cause aberrations in the mucus layer or in the actual tissue, which is going to cause little pockets where the stomach acid is going to eat through your actual stomach lining itself, which can be very painful. Um, gallbladder diseases like gallstones or um, inadequate amount of water absorption or intake can, can do can cause diarrhea or constipation. Um, we'll also talk about hemorrhoids, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's cancer, and celiacs. All right, so gastroesophageal reflux is the first one we're talking about. That's when that lower esophageal sphincter, remember that's at the bottom of the esophagus and at the top of the stomach, and if it doesn't close entirely, hydrochloric acid can come into the esophagus, can cause what's called heartburn and stomach acid reflux. Some factors that can um, be eliminated to help treat this include eating chocolate, fatty foods, coffee, soda, onions, and garlic. Additionally, some lifestyle choices can include tight-fitting clothing, smoking, um, obesity, large evening meals, and then also reclining after eating, which can mean that you're going to perhaps let that acid leak out of that sphincter. So we can have dietary changes or behavior modifications that can assist these individuals. Now, esophageal cancer is one of those um, awful cancers of the digestive tract. Typically, it's going to be affecting males who smoke and drink heavily. Um, treatment can often include surgery and radiation and chemotherapy. Oftentimes, if they're going to be treating the esophagus, you're going to have to have a stomach tube put in to feed you. Um, belching is going to be caused by too much air getting in the tract, eating too fast, drinking too fast, drinking too many carbonated beverages, etc., chewing gum aggressively, smoking and swallowing air, all of these can cause too much air in the stomach. Now, if that ends up getting too far down in the stomach and the air is going to be causing the intestines, that's going to come out in the form of flatulence. Um, so stomach flu and foodborne illnesses are both going to have similar symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramping, etc. And they're both going to be treated in similar ways, rest, rehydration, soft foods. Um, sometimes foodborne illnesses, if they've been contaminated with a, some sort of pathogen, sometimes you might be given some sort of antibiotic if that pathogen is actually winning, but typically you're just told to rest and get yourself back on your feet. Now I talked about ulcers. Ulcers are typically caused by Helicobacter pylori. Basically what happens is you end up with a erosion or a, a sore in the lining of the stomach or in the upper part of the small intestines. And it can be extremely painful, burning pain, because you've got hydrochloric acid on an open wound. Symptoms can include vomiting, fatigue, bleeding, and general weakness. And treatment can usually include things like prescription drugs. Um, but we can also make dietary changes, like eating less acidic foods or eating in smaller amounts so that we have, uh, and eating more regularly so we're not skipping meals. All of that can mean that the HCL that's going to be in there can be utilized towards the food instead of towards your stomach lining. Um, additionally, we can have surgery to remove some of the ulcerative regions of the intestines. Now, an untreated ulcer can result in um, a peritonitis, um, which is basically going to be scar tissue in the and uh, an inflammation causing scar tissue in the intestines, which can cause food to be obstructed. It can cause you to get sick, vomiting, weight loss, etc., and also increase your risk for stomach cancer as well. Um, gallbladder disease occurs, or gallstones, occur when stones are formed from excess cholesterol, and when that cholesterol builds up, then it can actually block the secretion of the gallbladder. It can be very, very painful. Treatment can include sonication or shockwave therapy, a combination of that and prescription medication, or as a last resort, um, surgery to remove the gallbladder. And while this can be kind of a problematic for individuals in terms of eating and digesting fats. Remember, bile is going to be what's responsible for digesting the fats. Eventually, the body will adapt by secreting the bile directly into the duodenum itself. So instead of having a gallbladder to serve as an organ that holds that secretion, it's just going to secrete it directly into the small intestines. Here's an example of an ulcer. You can see right here. looks kind of painful. It's going to be an open lesion whereby the, the um, food is going to be able to I'm sorry, the stomach acid is going to be able to sit directly in that cavity there. 
Um, now, celiac disease is a little bit different. It's when someone has an allergic reaction to gluten that causes damage to the small intestine. So here's what normal healthy villi look like. And normal people who eat gluten are going to have their villi look just like this. But someone with celiacs who eats gluten going to have their flattened villi look like this. So if they don't eat gluten, they look normal, but when they do eat gluten, they're going to cause flattened villi, which as you can imagine, decreases the surface area, which decreases their absorption, which can cause nutrient malabsorption, which basically means that you could be starving yourself on nutrients even though you're eating the right amount of food. Typically, this is going to be a reaction found to gluten, which was found in rye, wheat, and barley, and can cause multiple different symptoms, which are sometimes mistaken for irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease, and typically, you're going to take a nutritionist to figure this out, but the symptoms can include bloating in the abdomen, um, cramping and gas, diarrhea, foul-smelling stools because we're not absorbing um, all of the, we're not breaking down and properly absorbing the nutrients, which means that we're getting more sugar sent into those bacteria in the intestines, which are going to cause um, foul-smelling stools during their process of breaking things down. It can also cause weight loss and bone or joint pain because you're not getting the nutrients that you need even though you are eating the amount of food that you think you should be eating. And it can also cause anemia, which is a, a deficiency generally in iron. And again, it's not because you're not eating enough iron, it's because you're having a hard time absorbing it. And it can be very serious because it can cause risk of brutal bones or osteoporosis, shortened stature, seizures, etc. Um, the good news is it's an easy diagnosis, and it's a pretty easy treatment plan. So once people figure out what's wrong with them, they can typically get right back on track. The main thing that they have to do is follow a gluten-free diet, basically eliminate anything that contains wheat, which will include milk, meat, eggs, fruits, vegetables, potatoes. All of these are okay. Um, they can also tolerate a small amount of oats, but not a lot because there, are, there is still some gluten in oats. And in order to be gluten-free, you're going to have to basically read all of the labels to make sure that you don't have any gluten in there. You're going to have to make substitutions. So no whole wheat bread. You can have gluten-free whole grains instead. Um, you have to pay attention to packaged foods because some things have gluten in them that might not appear to have gluten in them, like food starch, dextrin, malt, and malt syrup. Um, you can't have coffee flavorings. All of those are going to have gluten in them, although you are able to have things like wine and sake and distilled spirits. Now, um, you're not able to have beers, but you are able to have ciders, for example. And then there's a whole list of products for the GFCO and CSA seal that you can take a look at and find out if these products are actually gluten-free. Now, recently gluten-free diets have become all the rage and people do it because it seems to be a fad. However, if you don't have celiac disease, you really shouldn't be avoiding gluten foods. Um, and that's because gluten-free diets generally are eliminating food and the food that's eliminated tends to be very nutritious. And while gluten itself doesn't provide nutritional benefits, again, it's often found in food that offers other nutrients like fiber, vitamins, and minerals that have better health benefits. So not only are they very expensive, but you have to really pay attention to substitutions when you're eliminating certain micronutrients from your diet. Um, flatulence is when we have too much intestinal gas. In most adults, it happens about 10 to 20 times a day on a normal day, and it can be caused by a lot of things, but typically high in fiber and high, foods high in fiber and high in starch are going to cause intestinal gases to be created and then off gas. Same as what we said previously for, for belching, um, eating quickly and drinking carbonated beverages, if that gas makes it through the stomach and into the small intestines, it's going to go out the other way in the form of flatulence. Also lack of exercise, so if you're sedentary, you can allow these large pockets of air to build up when while you're moving around, the little pieces of air kind of work their way out throughout the day. This is often why in the very first thing in the morning when you start moving around, you'll have um, early morning gas because you've been sitting all night and so the pockets have kind of like built up on their own. Um, and additionally, smoking can increase this because apparently when you smoke, you can also ingest or um, air sometimes, which can then get sent into the stomach and then out in the intestines and then out through flatulence. Now, another intestinal disorder is going to be diarrhea, which is the opposite of constipation. Diarrhea is when we have too much water going through, so we have loose stools. that ha can happen either more than three times in a row um, or more than three times in a day. And usually this can happen from bacteria, viral, or parasitic infections. Oftentimes these are going to be the kind of things that will be passed through your body very quickly in just a couple of days. But if we have a chronic condition, typically that's a more serious problem. And oftentimes it can lead to malnutrition because it, oftentimes it means you're not absorbing the nutrients properly. 
Eventually, it can lead to dehydration and potentially death, particularly in small and immunocompromised adults, so in children and the elderly. And it's treated not just replacement of fluids, so drinking water isn't going to be enough because you're also secreting all of these electrolytes. So you're going to have to drink something that has electrolytes in it as well, like Pedialyte. Constipation, flip side of the diarrhea coin, it's going to be the infrequent passage of stools that are very hard, usually due to insufficient either fiber. Remember, fiber is going to be like the broom that sweeps the inside of the intestines, and although it's going to pull water out of the intestines, it's also going to allow things to move about a little bit and prevent things from getting super dry and hardened in pockets. So the other cause of constipation can be lack of water intake, and it can also be caused by stress quitting smoking, inactivity, and other various illnesses. So there's a whole panel of things that you might want to check for if you have a patient that comes in with severe constipation. Normally, treatment involves correcting their eating patterns, making sure that they're putting the right food into their stomach as well as the right amount of liquids, and also sometimes proper rest. We can also use laxatives or stool softeners, but laxatives, laxatives themselves can cause dehydration and salt imbalances, and when used for long periods of time, the body can become dependent on laxatives so that it's unable to pass without the addition of laxatives. Um, one of the things you want to avoid is a colon cleanse when you're actually going to be using a bunch of water to flush it out. Typically, the problem is going to be far upstream from that, and you can cause damage to the internal tissues by, by this method. Um, hemorrhoids are what happens when your veins in the rectum and the anus are going to swell, can be itchy, lead to bleeding and or pain. Generally, the cause is unknown, but typically it has to do with strain, strain to pass constipated stool, strain from pregnancy, uh, constipation, diarrhea, etc., and also just general muscle weakness associated with aging. Now, while severe cases may require surgery, most symptoms like the itching and the pain can be relieved by ice packs, soaking in a warm bath, use of creams like Preparation H, or physical reinsertion of the hemorrhoids. Now, irritable bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease are both kind of catch-alls for, we're not really sure what's going on, but you're having some sort of malabsorption problem. And irritable bowel syndrome is just defined as an abnormal colon rhythm and an over-response to colon stimuli. Now, it can result in diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, and fluctuate back and forth from all of those. It can have a complete urgency or insistence for defecation. And while we don't know the exact cause, again, multiple individuals might have different causes. It's kind of a catch-all. But treatment is generally going to include dietary changes, like increased dietary fiber, and sometimes prescription drugs. Now, ulcerative colitis is basically going to be an inflammation of the large intestines that creates ulcers in the lining of the colon. It tends to be genetic, tends to affect men and women equally at an early onset, about 15 to 30. Although there is no cause or cure, drug therapy does seem to stave this off, and sometimes we can also have surgery to remove the ulcerative areas. Remember, we have a large amount, several feet of intestines, so if we only have to remove a little bit of it to remove the area that's ulcerative and get the rest of it back to healthy, we can do that with restorative surgery. Um, now, Crohn's disease, as I mentioned previously, is another catch-all. No known cause, no known cure. Um, we can use drugs to, uh, to attempt to treat it and also possibly surgery if we end up with ulcerations. Um, the difference between Crohn's disease and irritable bowel is that Crohn's disease have defined ulcers. So we have ulcers that are going to appear throughout the gastrointestinal tract that are going to at least be part of the hindrance for nutrient absorption. Additionally, colon cancer is a, um, a intestinal disorder. It's one of the most curable cancers if caught early, but is the third leading cause of cancer death due to lack of detection. Um, it's going to start with small polyps that can eventually turn into cancerous tumors if we don't if we avoid the early detection. Typically, treatment is going to include radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery. And as always with most cancers, survival rates depend on multiple things. First and foremost, stage of cancer diagnosis. Secondarily, response to treatment and the age of the individual. Here's an example of a colon polyp. We can have normal colon polyps that can then be removed and not turn into cancer, or we can have a polyp sit there for a little while and then turn it into it will turn into cancer. This slide is basically an overview of all of the different disorders that I just spoke about and their symptoms their cause, and their treatment. So this summarizes the past several slides. Thank you so very much for sitting with me today. I really appreciate your time. Happy studying and aloha.